Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dennis Stoda. And I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. Every year, more than 10,000 people in the United States are diagnosed with life-threatening diseases such as leukemia or lymphoma, for which a bone marrow transplant is the best or only treatment. And a bone marrow transplant is also known as a stem cell transplant. It's a procedure that infuses healthy blood stem cells into your body to replace your damaged or diseased bone marrow. And these cells can come from your own body, or they can even come from a donor. Here to discuss bone marrow transplant is the director of bone marrow transplant program at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Dr. William Hogan. Welcome to the program, Dr. Hogan. Thank you very much, Sanj and Dennis. Just, to, uh, just so I can understand, basically, now when you're talking about a bone marrow transplant, what, what exactly is that? So uh, bone marrow transplant kind of encompasses a, a number of different procedures. So there is both autologous and mm -hmm. allogeneic bone marrow transplant, and they're quite different. And so the majority of patients that we have in Rochester undergo autologous bone marrow transplant, about three quarters compared to about a quarter undergoing allogeneic transplant. An autologous transplant is where we take your own cells and then use high-dose chemotherapy to kill a leukemia or a lymphoma or multiple myeloma and then infuse your own cells back in once again. And so it's really relying on the high-dose chemotherapy to try and uh, kill the leukemia or the myeloma cells and not so much on the donor cell, on the cells. An allogeneic transplant is a little bit different. Uh, that involves uh, getting a donor. So it's more like a solid organ transplant where you might think of somebody getting a kidney transplant where there's a donor involved. And that's in a situation where we think that the uh, chemotherapy alone is not sufficient to eradicate the disease. And we use the immune system of the donor to help out there and try and eradicate the residual leukemia or lymphoma cells. And sometimes that's more effective for certain type of diseases. In among those diseases, give us an idea of some of the predominant conditions in which a physician will turn to a bone marrow transplant to help their patient. So the majority of people that we see are people that have blood cancers of some sort. So usually things like multiple myeloma, lymphoma, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or acute leukemias, or even a condition called myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a type of a bone marrow failure syndrome. Uh -huh. Sometimes we also use it for other bone marrow failure syndromes, such as aplastic anemia, where the bone marrow fails for whatever reason. And this can benefit somebody at any age? Essentially so. Yeah, we have patients that uh, range in age from less than a month in our pediatric program My. to up into their 70s or very occasionally late 70s and, and beyond. It depends on the type of procedure, and certain procedures are only appropriate for certain uh, age groups. Uh, but uh, there may be an option, depending on the whole spectrum of age, there might be an option available for that person. So you mentioned uh, a myriad of different conditions there. What, what are the sort of generalized signs and symptoms that somebody may be having that would uh, go along those conditions? Right, so it, it's really very uh, specific to the condition, but mm -hmm. for somebody with acute leukemia, for instance, oftentimes we see two main problems. One is where the bone marrow, uh, which is the factory for the blood cells, where that fails. And when you have a failure of the factory of the bone marrow producing cells, you can get a low hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying red cells. And so that can lead to shortness of breath or fatigue or tiredness or just a general exhaustion. If you have a, a failure of the white cell production, the white cells are very important in trying to prevent or treat infections. And so then people can sometimes get bloodstream infections or other types of infections, skin infections, lung infections, those kind of things. And finally, the third component is the platelets. And the platelets are very instrumental in preventing bleeding. And so sometimes bleeding or bruising uh, can be a presenting sign there as well. And it very much depends on the disease. For certain diseases like multiple myeloma, there's a very uh, strong bone-specific uh, component to it. So sometimes bone fractures or bone disease osteoporosis may be a component of that. Before we, you know, move on to the mechanics of performing a bone marrow transplant, people often uh, may have uh, mixed ideas about whether or not this is to achieve a cure or is this to control a condition. What's, what's the best outcome? So it depends, again, on the type of situation. There are outcomes in some circumstances where the goal is cure of the disease, and that's a permanent cure, uh, eradicating the disease permanently. There are other situations where that's not the goal, and it's not possible. And so in that situation, it may be that the, the goal is to try and help delay 
or prevent the progression of the disease for a period of time and then maybe spare that person from having other treatments in the meantime or maybe make other treatments more effective. So it very much depends on the type of disease and the scenario. So it's not really possible to give a general answer to that, but in some circumstances our goal is cure and in other circumstances the goal is trying to control the disease better and delay the onset of progression. I see. So you, you had mentioned there's basically two types of treatments. You either use your own cells or, or a donor cell. So if, if you're using your own cells, for example, how does that process work? So typically, uh, today, we use a, a peripheral blood stem cell collection. Peripheral blood is just our regular bloodstream, and stem cells are stem cells are the cells that basically form all of the other blood cells. And they normally reside in the bone marrow. And so as part of this process, what we do is give a medication to try and release the stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood, and then we collect them uh, through a catheter that goes into the arm or sometimes into the chest, kind of like dialysis. Mm -hmm. So the blood is processed through the machine, and then we skim off the uh, stem cells and then return the majority of the blood back to the patient. And then those cells are taken and stored, frozen, and then we uh, uh, can then uh, give the patient a treatment that kills the leukemia or the lymphoma or the myeloma. That's usually high-dose chemotherapy. And the reason why we want to take the cells out in advance is so that those are protected from the chemotherapy and, and not injured. And then when the chemotherapy has done its job of trying to kill as much of the blood cancer as possible, then we infuse those cells back in again. And they are then not being exposed to the chemotherapy, so they're in a position then to try and replicate and reconstitute the bone marrow very quickly. Whereas uh, if we did this without taking out those stem cells, then they wouldn't be able to recover ah. as well, or it would take very, very long time to do that, and then that would complicate things and make the patient more prone to get into trouble with infection or other problems. And, and so how long does that take, for example? I mean, this is obviously not a same-day procedure. No. So normally uh, what we do is a patient goes through a bunch of screening tests to make sure that they're healthy enough and that we have things optimized as much as possible. Usually then we give growth factor shots uh, over a few days, and then we start collecting. So it's something like four days of growth factor shots, and then we start collecting for another two, three, four days, and then uh, freeze those cells. And then after that comes the part where the chemotherapy is given, and that's oftentimes given over one to four or five days, depending on the regimen. And then after that, we infuse the cells back in again. It takes another couple of weeks for the blood counts to recover after that. And what about the situation where one needs to rely on a donor? So that's a, uh, there are many different donor options, and so oftentimes we think about it as being a, a family member, so a brother or sister, and so that's an option, but as we are seeing older and older patients that are candidates for bone marrow transplant, also their siblings are older, and sometimes they're not available or healthy enough to be considered as a donor. Mm. So if a sibling donor is not available, then the option we look at the unrelated donor registry. And so across the world, there's about 20 million people who have signed up to be considered as volunteers for a person that needs a bone marrow transplant. This is an amazing thing if you think about it. You know, take somebody just volunteering to take a week out of their life, go through this procedure of collection, and then uh, doing this for somebody that might be living across the world that they've never met and have no idea who they are. But people do this, and about 20 million people have signed up to do it. And so then they go through the collection process, and then we can infuse the cells after they get shipped here. There's two different types. Uh, oftentimes we'll take peripheral blood, which I just described, or sometimes we'll actually do a bone marrow harvest where the person goes to the operating room and they have uh, a needle put in the back of the pelvis to extract bone marrow directly from the, uh, from the bone marrow, and then we use that as the source of graft. I see. All right, and um, is there a risk associated with this? So being a donor, there are some risks, but in general, it's, it's uh, well controlled and it's rare that a patient or a donor would undergo uh, long-term injury as a result. But there's always some risk with any procedure, and uh, uh, so we do counsel those donors uh, very carefully before going forward. Very good. Well, we appreciate uh, all of your insights this morning, and I'm sure people have a much better understanding of, of this whole process. Sure. Uh, just uh, as a final word, I would encourage people to go to bethematch.com. If they're interested in being a donor, there's a huge need for more donors. And if you are especially between the ages of 18 and 45, then please consider looking at Be The Match and seeing if you might be potentially considered as a donor as well. Bethematch.com. We've been talking with the director of the bone marrow transplant program at Mayo Clinic Rochester, Dr. William Hogan. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hogan. Thank you very much. My pleasure.